Well, amen. Good morning, church. How are we this morning? Good. <laughs> it's 11 o'clock. It's right before lunch. Well, it's good to see you. Uh, as we get going this morning, we will be in the book of Psalms. So if you will take your Bibles, uh, whether that be your personal Bible, a device, or if you need one, there should be a Bible in either the, the seat rack underneath your seat or the one in front of you. Uh, you can find a Bible there and turn to Psalm chapter 51 with me, please. As we do so, just, um, man, just a reminder of how great our worship team is. Uh, Luke does a great job every week of helping put together songs that speak to and speak into, that flow alongside the passage we're going to be in, and that's no, um, no different than this morning. And so uh, there's part of me that just wants to sit down and say we can go home because we've already sung the gospel uh, and the goodness of God's salvation so much this morning. So I'm grateful for a team that uh, puts that together each week. Um, as we think about that, I would say it's no easy task to preach. Now, I don't get to do this every single week, uh, but some of you, that, you think that's all that, that John does. Uh, he just prepares to preach, and, and that's it, and goes home and prays a lot and, you know, <laughs> sings Twyla Paris or something. I don't know what you think, but uh, there's so much more to what we do as ministers and as pastors. Um, but one of the one of the opportunities and the, the privileges it is to preach, uh, there's so much that we want to say. And it's tough to do in a timely and in a succinct way. Uh, everything that I would love to unpack about Psalm 51 today, uh, you guys probably don't want to sit here until four o'clock and have me do that. Uh, but that's how, there's, there's stuff that every week, uh, as, you, as someone prepares to preach, they leave on what we call the cutting room floor. Uh, they have to cut out this incredible richness and goodness uh, knowledge that we've, that we've taken away over the week of studying this passage um, that you won't ever get to hear. Uh, so much so that uh, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, a famous pastor dubbed the Prince of Preachers in the 1800s, uh, when he thought about Psalm 51, he would say that he would come to read and prepare to preach from Psalm 51, and he would always leave just feeling, feeling unworthy. Uh, in fact, that quote goes on to say, he said, such a psalm may be wept over, may be absorbed into the soul, may be exhaled again in devotion, but commented on? Ah, and that's a quote. Um, Where is he who having attempted it can do but blush in defeat? And so basically he's saying like, it's such, it's so rich and there's so much there. And also as you come to Psalm 51, you just feel like I am not worthy. And so this morning we come, red faces blushing in our defeat, but hopeful for the spirit, God's spirit that will take and walk us through this passage together. We will read Psalm 51. So I invite you to stand, please, in the honor of the reading of God's word. As we read Psalm 51, and we're going to focus our reading time right now in uh, verses 10 through 13. And starting in verse 10, David writes these words, God, create a clean heart for me and renew a steadfast or a right spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore the joy of your salvation to me and sustain me by giving me a willing spirit. Then I will teach the rebellious your ways and sinners will return to you. May the Lord bless and use the reading of his word. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for your goodness, for your graciousness, for your faithful love and for your abundant compassion that David speaks to in Psalm 51. Father, we invite, knowing that this text is rich, it is thick, there is so much to take away from it. Father, we invite your spirit to speak to us and to teach us right now. God, we invite your spirit to stay with us and to continue to allow us to chew on and, and, and download and just absorb all that there is here. And we invite your spirit to do that work. Father, be with our time as we look at some simple yet profound truths that impact us all. And again, we ask your spirit to have our full attention 
and affection right now, and we ask it in Christ's name, amen. You may be seated. Our main point for today is simply that sin is more serious than we realize, and God is more merciful than we can imagine. Sin is more serious than we realize, and God is more merciful than we can imagine. For the context of Psalm 51, we go back to 2 Samuel. And this picks up on David's life of where he was and what was happening in the book of 2 Samuel. Uh, it, it is clearly portrayed in uh, the beginning of Psalm 51. The, uh, the subscription there says to the choir director, a Psalm of David, meaning David wrote it, when the prophet Nathan came to him after he had gone to Bathsheba. And so as we pick up in the story in 2 Samuel, we're not going to turn there, we're not going to read this, but just for reference, 2 Samuel chapter 12 details that of David being confronted by the prophet Nathan. And Nathan came and confronted David with his sin. If you back up about a year before that, and in chapter 11, you have the detail of what happened there, uh, of David involved in the biggest mistake of his life. Um, he was where he should not have been. Uh, if, if you know um, anything about our students or have a student, maybe you've heard them say a certain phrase before. Uh, but somebody who has done student ministry at this church, at this campus specifically for the last seven or eight years, uh, I moved into my, my role as executive pastor after being student minister. One of the things we teach our students is what we call the big five. Uh, students, do y'all know the big five? That's, I'm proud. I'm proud of this. This lives on past me, right? Uh, what is number five? I want to hear you say it. I love it. Be where you're supposed to be, when you're supposed to be there, doing what you're supposed to be doing. Okay? And you guys nailed it. Good job. Um, this for, I've been part of the Brentwood Baptist staff for about 16 years. And for the first probably 14 years of that, I, that was my role was to like every camp, every retreat we did, every mission journey, even like regular Sundays and Wednesdays, I was to get up and, and help people recite that. And so it makes me happy that that's so, so readily available. But we looked that to David, right? Obviously the big five did not originate with David. Uh, David missed rule number five. Uh, as we go back and look at 2 Samuel chapter 11, we see that David was not where he should have been. Uh, 2 Samuel chapter 11 begins with, it was the spring, the time when kings went off to war. And yet we see David in his palace, being idle, sleeping, taking it easy. He was not where he should have been. He was looking and thinking on things that he should not have been looking or thinking on. It says he awoke from his sleep, went out to the roof and looked down and saw Bathsheba bathing. And then he sent for her. That led him to pursue desires and actions that were not pleasing to the Lord. 2 Samuel details this part of David's life, his interactions with Bathsheba, and also his cover-up with Uriah, her husband. The man that in 1 Samuel chapter 13 we see dubbed the man after God's own heart, we see in 2 Samuel 11, following his own evil desires that lead him into the most dreadful of sin. And so we go back to our main point that sin is more serious than we realize, but God is more merciful than we can imagine. The first thing I want, that this, want us to see that this psalm points out is the realities of sin. The realities of sin. That again, sin is serious. It's far more serious than you or I ever usually ever give it credit for. A, a statement, a quote that has been said about sin. I've heard this most of my, uh, most of my life. I, began, I, I think I started hearing this phrase somewhere in my teenage years. I had a pastor that would quote this all the time. That sin will take you farther than you ever wanted to go. It'll keep you longer than you ever wanted to stay. And it will cost you more than you ever wanted to pay. And David would wholeheartedly agree with that statement. What began with idleness and a look 
quickly escalated into sexual deviance and eventually murder. David's life was on a crash course. When we think about our life, many of us will think, well, I haven't done that. I haven't had anybody murdered. Like, I'm good. But when we look at the seriousness of sin, we must understand we are the ones that have classified sins as big, as bad. We're the ones that have put qualifications on what counts as a bad sin versus a, ah, that's okay, it's a little white lie. It's not a big deal. We are the ones that have classified that. Sin is sin. And all sin is rebellion against God. No matter the size, it is a big deal. I want you to have this image of what sin is in your brain. And that is, think of an archer. Someone who professionally shoots a bow and shoots an arrow. And I want you to think about that archer. They have their bow. They have every service I've done like this, like I'm Robin Hood, but I'll just keep that up, right? They've got the quiver full of arrows. And I want you to think about that professional as they line up the targets downrange and they take their arrow, put it in the bow, and they pull back with all their might, with all their strength. And they let go of that arrow. And time after time, arrow after arrow, quiver after quiver, we see those arrows pile up woefully short of the target. That is the picture we have of what sin is. It is. It is missing the mark. It is falling short. The fair and the plain truth is that you and I are that way. Our sin, we cannot stand up to God. We cannot hit the mark of perfection. Every time we will sit there and we will try and we will fall woefully short. We will miss the mark. We won't even be on the board That is the picture of sin. Sin is our inability to ever be right and to ever be okay on our own with God. Now, culture speaks contrary to this. Culture will tell us that our personal truth is the greatest pursuit, is the meaning of life. Culture will tell us that our happiness is the supreme pursuit, that whatever we feel must be right. And the lies of the enemy have not changed, even as we go back to the first chapters of the Bible in Genesis 3, when the snake plants seed of doubt in Eve's mind and in Adam's mind. The enemy wants to do the same today. The enemy wants us to doubt God's goodness, just like in the garden. The enemy wants us to push our way through life. And as Fleetwood Mac would say, that we can go our own way. Thank you. (laughs) But the bad, horrible, no good news that I have for you today is that you and I are guilty. You and I are guilty of sin. Our sin that separates us from God. Our, Our sin that when we try to do stuff falls woefully short of accomplishing the task. We are imperfect sinners, incapable of saving ourselves. Romans chapter three in the New Testament says that very plainly, that there is no one that is righteous, not even one, that all have sinned and fall short of God's glory, which is his perfection. And that's David's point that even from the beginning, we'll see in verse five, he says, indeed, I was guilty when I was born. I was sinful when my mother conceived me. He was not making a comment of how he was conceived. He was simply saying that you and I, David, and everyone is born into this world sinful, broken, not being able to reach God on our own. There is nothing we can do. So here's what sin does as we look at Psalm 51. We're gonna see some, what they call Hebrew parallelism in the poetry here And I want us to look at verse two. It starts by saying that sin stains. Sin stains. He says in verse two, completely wash away my guilt and cleanse me from my sin. Jump down to verse seven. He says to purify me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Now today, 
there are some people, some designers, some fashion people. Obviously, I don't have a good sense of fashion, but that's okay. Some fashion people would say that, that the stained look is cool. That's why people will buy jeans already ripped up. I've seen, uh, <clears throat> I've seen ads for, for uh, jeans and shirts that already have stains on them because we're not messy enough on our own to just do that. We have to pay extra for it. The epitome of sin that I've seen this week would be a pair of jeans that cost over $600 that are pea-stained. That's gross. Yes, like urine, not like little peas, right? That's just gross, okay? So fashion would say, oh, that's great. That's in, that's beautiful. But when we bring that back to the idea of sin that stains, there is nothing beautiful about sin. Sin is hideous. It is ugly. The enemy wants us to believe that sin is something to be pursued, that sin is a prize, that sin is beautiful, and that once we get it, we will feel fulfilled. But we go back to the beginning of Genesis and we see time and time again. We look at Exodus. We follow all the way through scripture, all the way through human history. And every time a human has come within the grasp of sin, they never say, this is beautiful. They say, woe is me. Sin is ugly. It is hideous and it is more serious than you or I understand. David knew this, and that's why he cries out to God to be cleaned, to be washed, to have the sins removed from him. The second thing, sin not only stains, but it shames. It shames. Look in verse three. He says, for I am conscious of my rebellion, and my sin is always before me. Can I get that water real quick? My sin is always before me. If you jump down to verse eight, he says, let me hear joy and gladness and let the bones you have crushed rejoice. The idea there being the weight of shame that was on David. It was always before him. If you've ever had a huge mistake in your life, whether it be sin or a failure at work or school or something, you know the weight of that. I can think back to, to missing shots in basketball games that were game winners. I can think to you know, mishandling a relationship or saying something, oh, I really wish I wouldn't have said that, right? And you feel the weight of that shame and it stays with you. And that's how David felt. He said, this is constantly on me. Everywhere I look, I can't help but see it and feel it and think about it. And he comes down and says, God, I need you to speak life over me. I need to hear good news because I am constantly feeding myself the bad news of my shame, the bad news of my guilt. I constantly see my stain and it's killing me. That's what shame does. It seeks to cripple us, to crush us like we have broken bones. As a parent of seven children, I have no lack of stories of people trying to figure out their way in life and then walking in that shame. Uh, specifically, the toddler years are ones where it's basically, I mean, it's just people trying to, it's just a toddler trying to figure out life and they basically, they are the definition of sin. Uh, they don't listen, they don't obey, they're pressing every limit they can. You tell them no over here and then you look around and then they're doing exactly what you just told them not to do. They're just, they're just trying it all out. And so I'll use my one child that's not in the room right now, the toddler. Recently, we <clears throat> something, had something happen at the house and I looked at my wife and I said, that's gonna be used on Sunday as part of the sermon. So our three-year-old walks in to our bedroom. She had been outside playing and she kind of walks in, looks, and she's like, I need to wash my eyes, which every three-year-old says, right? 
No, it just struck me as odd. I was like, what three-year-old says, I need to wash my eyes out. That's weird. Uh, goes into our bathroom and she goes, sticks her little head out and she goes, I need privacy and closes the door. And we're like, okay, this ought to be good. <clears throat> so as she spends a few moments in there, it kind of starts to whimper and cry. And we're like, what's going on, baby? And wouldn't you know, our toddler broke rule number five too. She didn't do what she was, she did what she was not supposed to do. With the weather as it is, the sun getting, the days getting longer, the sun getting hotter, those UV rays, we had bought some spray sunscreen for our kids to put on outside. And we had told our three-year-old, you are not to mess with this and spray this. And what did she do? As a three-year-old, she looked at it and went right in her face, right? So her painful lesson gets to be our illustration of this shame this morning. Because what happens often is the way we respond, the same way my three-year-old responded. When we get caught in our sin, when we realize that we have stepped over God's boundary lines, even looking at the words that David uses here in verse one and two, he talks about blot out my rebellion. Completely wash away my guilt, cleanse me from all my sin. And we see the words rebellion and sin and guilt there throughout this chapter. Those are words that all are distinct words that all speak to us rebellion, stepping over God's boundaries. Guilt is us being morally impure, that we're not good in and of ourselves. And sin, again, the fact that we miss the mark, we fall short. Often when we find ourselves in those situations, we do exactly what my three-year-old did. We try to hide it. We try to take it on ourselves and try to fix it ourselves. We say to God, God, I need privacy right now. I need you to leave me alone so I can try to figure this out. David had been there too. David had been there for the last year trying to figure out and fix his own sin. And it was not going well. Sin stains us and it shames us. We try to deal with our sin in our terms, but we ultimately realize as David did, I have to turn to one who is stronger than I, the one who can take on and deal with my sin. And the third thing is sin does is it separates. In verse four through six, David says, against you and you alone, God, I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Now, David right here is in no way diminishing his sin on the vertical level. He is in no way saying, I didn't sin against Bathsheba. I didn't sin against Uriah. I didn't sin against the nation of Israel. He was simply saying, if you, tr if you trace all that back, the root is that vertical relationship. He had broken God's rules and God's commands. And anytime we break God's rules and God's commands, that's the start of it, right? And usually it's gonna filter out and affect our horizontal relationships as well. So David was not under, undermining like, hey, I didn't really hurt these other people. He was agreeing with that, but ultimately, and back to the root of things, his root sin was against God. And that causes for that separation. He goes on and talks about his, how he's guilty, how he's fallen short, and how he deserves God's judgment. He is in full agreement with what he has done is wrong, and he recognizes the, the separation that that brings. William Plumer was a theologian and an author in the 1800s. He has a big, fat psalm commentary that's one volume, like one of the thickest books I have. And in speaking about Psalm 51, and in speaking of the seriousness of sin, he writes this, if we think lightly of sin, we shall not much be concerned to get rid, rid of its guilt or its defilement, or be very watchful against its assaults, or very thankful for supposed deliverance, if of its cure or its power. In other words, Plumer is saying, if we take sin lightly, then it sin's not a big deal. We can easily write it off, justify it, put it under the rug and just put it over there for later. If we take sin not seriously, then we think we can handle it. But scripture tells us very plainly and very clearly 
that we cannot, that we are incapable, that we fall short. David agreed here in taking sin, not lightly, but seriously. And he shows us the seriousness of sin because we see in Psalm 51 that he owns it. Never in Psalm 51 do we see him try to blame others. Do we see him give excuses or justifications? Oftentimes when we come and approach our sin, that's what we do. We see that, that's human nature, right? We see that in the garden. Well, it's the woman you gave me. It's the snake you created. It's this person, it's that person. Well, at least I'm not like this. We do this still today. We as humans have learned not a whole lot over, over thousands of years. We still do this today. As we come and we think about this and we look back at David, he owns it. He offers no excuses, no blames, no justification, and he brings his confession to the one who counts, the one who is able to do something about it, who can heal. For his stains, he asks God to wash. For his shame, he asks God to speak life. And for his separating sin, he acknowledges that it's against him he has sinned and that he feels that separation. Sin is serious. It's more serious than you and I often realize, which is why we need to do the second thing that we see in this psalm, and that is to repent from sin. Repent from sin. Knowing that repentance leads to restoration. God's restoration is a humbling display of his mercy. It is a humbling display of his mercy. Now, church, this is the good news. The sin part was the very bad news. The repentant part is the very good news of the gospel, that our guilt, our sin, our shame, our stains have been atoned for. Payment has been made on our behalf by Jesus. Everything that David said in Psalm chapter 51, verse one, is true. He invites God, he asks God to be gracious why? Because God alone is the one who can be gracious. Because it's who he is, according to your faithful love, according to your abundant compassion. He calls out to God because God is the one who is able. The only one who is able. And in his repentance, David makes a few requests that we're going to look at in 10 through 13. The first thing he requests is to be, made, is to be renewed to be renewed. In verse 10, he says, God, create a clean heart in me and renew a steadfast or a right spirit in me. The Hebrew word there is bara, and it's the same word that we find in Genesis 1 that speaks to the creation of the heavens and the earth. The idea of bara means out of nothing. So in other words, David is not saying, hey, why don't you slap a fresh coat of paint on my heart and just make it look better? Make it look good. No. David says, get in there and do your work. Do a full overhaul. Renew that puppy. Make it new. In the New Testament, the way that looks like is what Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians uh, 5.17, where he says, if any person is in Christ, they are a new creation. That old things have gone away. Behold, all things are new. That is the work of the Spirit. Other places of Scripture talks about people having a heart of stone, but God giving us a heart of flesh. In other words, a heart that is stone, it's hard, it is un, you can't do anything with it, but a heart of flesh you can make and mold. And that is what God does. He gives us a new heart. He gives us a new heart. C.S. Lewis said it this way, that Jesus did not come to make bad people good. In other words, he didn't just make us come to make us look pretty on the outside, but he came to make dead people alive. That is the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that God gives us a new heart, that if you are in Christ, you are a new creation, not just a prettier version of the old self. But God is making you and consistently making you into something new. That is a picture of his glorious and his glorious mercies that we cannot understand. 
We second see in verse 11, the request to remain. He says, do not banish me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. If you think back to where David was, what David had seen in his life, he had seen God's spirit leave a leader before. See, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit did not come and dwell with with followers of God. Uh, Salvation in the Old Testament was based on one's belief that the Messiah would come. They did not know Jesus by name, but they believed in God and they followed God, trusting that God would send a Messiah. And the Holy Spirit comes from time to time, but in certain situations. And in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 16, we see God's spirit leave King Saul, a king who also had done evil in the sight of the Lord and who was continuing to pursue that route, running away from God and, and not towards God. And so to have this imagery in our brain, in our mind, that I'm sure that's what David had in his mind, he had seen a man of God fall before. He had seen God leave, God's spirit leave that man. And so as David writes these words, he is writing and the fearfulness and asking God to stay with him. Now on this side of the New Testament, we understand that as Christ ascended into heaven, that God's promise was that a helper would come and that was God's Holy Spirit. That for us today, if you are a believer, a follower of Christ, the Holy Spirit of God dwells within you. That we are each Uh, If you believe in Christ, you you have the Holy Spirit that dwells within you. I do not have time to flesh this out fully, but let me throw up or throw out some scriptures for you that speak to this about us being sealed by the Spirit of God and how he, he is with the believer. John 14, verse 16, Ephesians 1, 13 through 14, 2 Corinthians 1, 22, Matthew 28, Verse 20 and Hebrews 13, 5. All those verses speak to the sealing of the Spirit and how God will not leave us. He will be with us uh, forever. So with this, we come back to David and think that there's times as believers today we can feel that way. It can feel like the Holy Spirit has left us, specifically when we're in times of sin, when we are consciously stepping over God's boundaries and we continue on that path we can feel sometimes like the Holy Spirit has left us. But scripture again would be clear that if you are a believer and a follower of Christ, the Holy Spirit will not leave you. He will not leave you. That there is repentance and the Spirit calls us to repentance. I would say times where we are in that area where we're consciously stepping over God's commands. We're consciously entering into sin and we feel like the Spirit has left us, it's because we have hardened our heart to the Spirit's nudging to repent and to return. There is a request to remain. And there is a request, I'm sorry, I need to go back and add this real quick before we leave that one, to remain. First John chapter nine, chapter one, verse nine, I apologize. First John chapter one, verse nine speaks to us about what we are to do as believers, New Testament believers. That if we confess our sin, God's word says, that he is faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from unrighteousness. In James chapter four, verse seven, it says to draw near to God and he will draw near to you. It's directional. If we're running away from God, the spirit is still there and calling to us. But if we harden our heart, That's oftentimes where we feel like he has left us. We need to draw near, to turn, repent, and come back to the Lord. In verse 12, the request is to restore. Restore to me the joy of my salvation, of your salvation, and sustain me by giving me a willing spirit. To restore is to bring something back into working and functional condition. David's heart being weighed down with the shame and stain and separation of sin. He needed that heart and that joy to be restored to him. And the third thing, the last thing he says in verse 13 is he requests uh, to respond. He says, then I will teach the rebellious your ways and sinners will return to you. David was not doing what you and I do often. He wasn't trying to make, let's make a deal with God. God, if you'll forgive me here, 
If you'll take away my sin, then I promise I'll never do it again. God, if you'll take away my sin, I promise I'll go, I'll go be a missionary for you. That's also not how the Tungits ended up in South Africa, just so we're clear, okay? But that's oftentimes how we approach our sin. God, if you'll do this for me, I promise I'll do this. And so many times, within a week, within a month, we find ourselves praying the same exact thing. God, but this time, I mean it. That's not what David was doing. David was just fast forwarding, knowing God's goodness and God's faithful love. He's telling God, because I'm going to be forgiven, I'm going to share of your goodness. I'm going to teach people and they're going to hear this good news and they're going to respond to it as well. He's making much of Jesus. Or, yes, of Jesus. He says in verse 13, he'll teach others. In verse 14, he'll sing about God's righteousness. In verse 15, he'll declare his praise. You and I, we're David. We're sinners. We're wretched, dirty sinners that are saved by grace, faithfully loved by God, who pours out his mercy and his grace upon us. God is merciful far more merciful than we can ever imagine. And this, in his mercy, he allows us to our last point, and that is to respond to the Savior. Verse 16 and 17. You do not want sacrifice, or I would give it. You are not pleased with burnt offerings. Think about the man who's writing this. King David, the man who had all the power. Dude could have made a decree. He could have done a, one of a number of things and given whatever he wanted as a sacrifice to the Lord. But David understood there's nothing I can do to make myself right with God. Nothing. Even the man who could have said, let's butcher thousands of cattle and sacrifice them to the Lord. Let's have a great big barbecue to the Lord. But he knew that was not going to please the Lord. In verse 17, the sacrifice that is pleasing to God is a broken spirit. And it, uh, you will not despise a broken and a humble heart. So as we look at a humble heart that brings healing, what does a humble or a broken heart look like? I want to give you two words. And the first one is to recognize. The second one is to run. We recognize that our sin is serious. It's what uh, Thomas Watson, a Protestant or a, a Puritan pastor, called the bitterness of sin. When we recognize the seriousness of our sin, which causes us to secondly run to our gracious God, which Watson called the sweetness of Christ. We run from our sin, or we recognize our sin, and we run to our Savior. David refers to this as sort of a living sacrifice. Words that Paul would use later in Romans chapter 12 about us believers being a living sacrifice to the Lord. That is that we live the entirety of our life for his sake. We battle temptation. We confess and repent of our sin. We grow in the knowledge and wisdom of Jesus Christ. But we're constantly doing as Jesus invited us to to deny ourselves, to take up our cross, and to follow him. As a Christian, we are continuously in progress, making progress, one step forward, two steps back sometimes, but we're working towards our sanctification, toward being like Jesus. Church sin, it's more serious than we realize, but God is more merciful than you or I can imagine. As we trace the steps of David through his life, we see that he did not escape the consequences of his sin. It resulted in, in personal pain and suffering. It resulted in the loss of a child. It resulted in turmoil within his kingdom, eventually splitting the kingdom of Israel into a north and a south kingdom. And we see God's mercy that followed David. God is faithful to forgive us. We also see that David is not taken out of the lineage of the coming Messiah. God in his mercy and in his grace, a promise that he kept to David to not blot him out, to not take him away or out of God's presence. 
And even as we think about David today, we still think of him as, yes, a flawed man, but a man after God's own heart. You and I are in that same place. We can be people who are flawed, but can be people after God's own heart. Today, listen, because the Spirit is inviting us to continue to recognize and run. Recognize that your sin is a mess and there's nothing you can do about it, which means we have to run to a Savior who is good and who is able to restore us and to give us the joy of his salvation. I want to invite you to bow your head and close your eyes. And the whole purpose of this is just to be still right now and to ask God's spirit to speak to us. We are never invited to come to God's word and just say, hey, I want to get some more information today. But God always is about the transformation. So I want to get out of the way and allow you just a few moments to sit with the spirit and invite the Spirit to speak to your heart of your next step of obedience.